Good. Uh, now again, my turn. So today's Jos and Carlos uh, sessions, I would say. I know Allegra is coming after after me. Uh, and I would like to talk a little bit about sampling and sample preparation. And this is actually the first time that I give this talk. So please forgive me if I say stupid things. Because it was an entire mental job that I had to do in the last two weeks to build this presentation. I never thought myself that we have we are so mechanical doing sample and sample preparation that we never thought about so many details. And then when I was searching about, you know, there's papers, there's books about sampling and sample preparation, and all of them have different approaches. Targeted, non-targeted, plan, microbial, endo, exometabolomic. So there's so many approaches of how you can ask and design your, your, your sampling that I try to compile everything in these slides. So if you said, no, Carlos, you're wrong, please let me know, okay? No, seriously, please let me know. Some of you can have more experience than me in, 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 in sample and sample preparation. So. I will do my best with sample and sample preparation. So what are the steps to prepare your sample and to get your sample ready for that acquisition? That this is what we will do with Allegra after the coffee break. First, sample collection. So the scientists come to the lab and collect the sample, isn't it? Second, the quenching. Some people will say, no, I don't like to do quenching, so I do quenching. Let's see what happens during the day. Then extraction of the metabolites. Some people dry the samples always. Some people doesn't want to dry the samples. We will discuss a little bit and I want to hear how, how, how's the experience here, okay? Because it's the very, very broad experience. Then we have a serial of possibilities when we have our, our metabolites in order to clean and to remove them to make our metabolites more accessible to the instrument. So we have different options that we can use. And I will at the end talk a little bit about them. And if you're working with GC, of course, we have to derivatize on some things in order to make it ready for GC uh, gas chromatograph. Okay? Somebody think, someone think that we have to add a special step here? Something else that we have to consider? This is not a tricky question. This is a real question. So do you think, oh, my experience, I have to add something else here. I, for example, have never worked with human samples, so I don't know, I don't have so much experience how it's with human samples. For example, sample collection, when it's on the field, how we maybe price the, the samples or dry the samples on the field to be able to get it into the lab. But, okay, so how do you do this sample collection that you have all yes. the process before? Okay, that's that part of the sample collection. Yes. Is, uh, the that you need to dry your or to on dry ice. Okay, and you let it dry in the field or you dry in the ovens, for example? Uh, I think we use dry ice. Ah, dry ice. Ah, okay. Yeah. To transform the sample. Yeah. Okay, now I get it. I, I understood the term. It's yeah. absolutely yeah. Okay, to transform the sample. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah. Is this only focused on plants? No, I will talk a little bit of microbials and I will talk a little bit of plants. And I will actually have one slide that I wanted to discuss because we work in a, a product system. So I wanted to discuss, we will discuss what, what, what we do in that plastic system because it's a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. So, a, you write the transportation of how we transport our samples. I will take consider it in sample collection. Okay, yeah, that's part of sample collection. So let's go with sample collection. Then, what we what do you think we should consider when we want to put? Yeah. Yes, that's it already have been considered, and it will be one of the steps for sure. Thank you very much. For sample collection, what do you think? What are the general aspects that we should consider when we want to collect our samples? Let's throw more ideas. Cross contamination, but it's something more general. So what do you think? What do you have? I have to sample. What do you think when I have to sample? 
What do you want to measure? Yeah, what is the question behind? Yeah, what else? There's many, many questions that you should ask before you sample. Yeah. Which tissue? Exactly. That's one other one. What is the tissue? What is the part of my system that I want to sample? Yeah, if they are plants, it's even very dry. I have an example. If they are plants, every part of the plant will give you a different metabolic profile. How to sample, not to get stressed so much to the samples, like you're taking microbiological samples. Yeah. Like, how to avoid uh, the, the covariate, how, how you like call changing it? Changing their metabolic like, because it changes. That, that's very important. Yes. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. So, yeah. What else? Yes. Yeah, especially for plants, what daytime are you going to the, time, the, the periodicity, the frequency of the sampling, isn't it? If I'm I'm sampling in the mornings, in the afternoons, or I'm doing a time course series experiment, all these things are very important. And I will I think we know it, but I will show you some examples why they are so important. Something else? Type of extraction you're going to use the like type of extraction. exactly what type of metabolites we want to know so what type of solvent later something else if you think about the material the, the, the system what what we what kind of things do you ask okay let me go first what is the biological material Okay, and this is very important because we want to know we have a plant, we have a microorganism, we have water, we have fluid. What what kind of material do we have? You can have everything what it's possible. So all kind of samples we can analyze, isn't it? But we need to think in, in many cases we have clones, we have varieties, we have genotypes. This has to be considered in order to have Samples that are reproducible, replicates that are really biological replicates. Okay, yeah, you got my point. Developmental stage, and I have an example for that. So it's very different if I sample a plant when it's a, a seedling, it's a tiny two week sample, or if it's a fully developed plant. But it's very different for microorganisms. If I sample the first day, the second day, because we for those of you who work with microorganisms, we know that they have this, this growing uh, 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 graph that at first is a, it's a exponential growing and suddenly it become very flat, it's it? very, very stable. And it's very different if I sample here at the beginning in the exponential phase or in the flat phase. It will give me a completely different metabolic rate. So those are things that we have to consider. Growing conditions. And this is something very important because I have seen papers comparing field experiments with climate chamber experiments with lab sampling experiments. And yes, we can compare those things, but sometimes for me, this is a little bit spooky for me because in metabolomics, I think we should compare a little bit, a little bit more strict to compare experiments that have been done all in the field or all in the greenhouse or all in, uh, in, in, in the lab or in the climate chamber. If I want to do a compare these things, I have to do a very well, fully randomized, incredible experiment to compare greenhouse with field, for example. Or if I want to compare samples that come from field with samples that I have in a beautiful incubator in my lab under perfect conditions. Those are completely different types of samples. So the experimental and you already learned from, from yours has to be very carefully designed for this kind of comparisons. Sample size, already just said, said it, so this is very important. Also, not only to, to have reproducibility in metabolomics, but also you have to think that in, in, in every lab, we have different types of resources. We have different we have different amounts of money to work with. You can maybe work with only ten plants and not with one hundred plants, so you can have less replicas, as I just already explained you. We also have to think about if somebody at some point shows up. 
Good. <laughs> so these are the eight aspects that I consider that we should think when we want to sample. So we want sample size, how many treatments, what kind of treatments we want to apply. The treatments should be equally applied to all the samples, should be as reproducible as we can. How many controls? Are these real controls? But this is something that I have seen a lot of problems in, in, in many experiments. We have controls for extraction, we have controls for sampling, we have how we have controls for the genotype, we have what what kind of controls we need for our sampling. Okay. Sampling frequency, you said so how. Uh, if we want to do a time course, if we want to sample in the morning, in the afternoon, what do you think? Is it very important to sample in the morning or if, in the afternoon? Or in the night, during the night? It's very important, isn't it? So we know that plants, have, we have these cycles, isn't it? And they have different metabolite, metal, actually there's people studying those uh, circadian rhythms in plants and in organisms. Polarity of our compounds, somebody said, what kind of compounds we want? What do I want to analyze? Do I want to analyze something volatile? Do I want to analyze something that is not volatile? So we have to think about all these little details, okay? Then, when is the biological uh, material? I, I just put these two examples. What, what about plants or microorganisms? So we can think about tissue sample for plants. We can sample each different tissue of the plant, flowers, leaves, stems, roots, etc., etc. But we can also do the whole plant sample. I used to work with whole plants, with legumes, and I, in order to not to have so much variability, I, I sampled the seedlings because they are in a specific stage and they were also infected by the insect. So you just sample the seedlings. This is a way to avoid so much variability over your tissue. Time for field sampling. So somebody mentioned field sampling. Do we, what do we have to consider? How to transform my samples into the into the lab, isn't it? I, for example, had this experience in the when I was in the Max land that I noticed that every time that I was sampling the greenhouse, and then one day I I don't know why I just said ah, I'm gonna want to sit down in the lab because it's more comfortable. My friends are here and I will listen music. So it's better. So I brought my plants into the into the into the lab. I'm telling you, this is this means five minutes because we take an elevator and then I am in the lab. And then I thought, and then I got a completely crazy results, and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And then I, I analyzed, I compared, I did again the same, and then I took half of the plants, took them to the lab, and half of the plants sampling in the in the, in the greenhouse, and they were having completely different. Uh, me metabolic profiles, just five minutes. And I'm telling you, this is just vibration of the trolley, <laughs> put it in the elevator up. And of course the temperature of the lab is also different than the greenhouse. That was enough to change the metabolic profiles of my, of my plants. So just imagine how from from field. So from field, you have to really think about how to transport this in the way that you change the metabolic profile. Okay. We can have time core samplings, and this is very, uh, we have to be very careful. If we are working with plants, we have to design, or we we will, depending on what is the question of our project, I would like to have a set of plants or a set of uh, replicates independent for each time course, because it's different if I have to take my sample in, in the morning and sample, and then in the afternoon, I take the same plan and then sample again the same plan. So this plan has been already formed. I cut it so the it, it has suffered. It, it, it has react to a treatment, to a touch, to a cut, to a, a injured, to be injured. And it it I have seen experiments like this of people cutting in the morning and then cutting another leaf in the afternoon. So we those are things that we have to consider. No, don't don't do it all. You have to do it. You can do it, of course, but it depends on the question that you have. You can have certain specific questions that you can handle in that way. A special sampling. So if I have a field experiment, so what happened? So I saw a, a really nice experiment. That what happened with the plants that are with the intercropping systems? What happened with the plants that are next to another crop? 
in comparison with dog ones who are a little bit more far away to an, to, to, to the uh, neighbor crop. And this, we of course, you can have samplings uh, in the field, and we call them the special, the special samplings. Okay, they are depending on how, what is the question that you can have. It's the same for microorganisms. You can have a culture connection, could be liquid, could be solid, and you have to scratch the cells depending on what you want to ask. Environmental samplings, you can go to the environment, to the field, and collect samples from stones, from water, from soils, etc. You can also just sample the biofilm, also do time course, or you can also just sample the microbia from another organism. It was a different type of biological materials that you can have. This is just an example that I want to show you how these guys sample actually the mass and different parts of the Arabidopsis. This is Nicotiana Tinuata. And they look how different is their metabolic profiles for the different tissues that they analyze. There was a beautiful work made for Dapendi and from uh, Emmanuel Becker. And they really noticed how the different tissues uh, uh, show a clearly distinct a metabolic profile and some of them are more similar and more specialized than others. Okay. You will have these slides by the end of the day, by the way. Okay. I would uh, if we want to think about growing phase, these guys also in Vienna with Professor Poner, they found that working with Ulva with this algae, they want to see how if they can find biomarkers for the different stages of the of the growing of Ulva. And then actually they did, they found that seven days, uh, 40, 40 to 20 days, and 48 to 49 eight samplings, they grew separately really, really good. So depending on the growing phase, you have a different metabolic profile. And that's why it's so important to define what is the growing phase that you want to sample? When does it make sense for your question to, to, to sample, uh, to, to, to make your sampling? This is a, a, a non-published uh, <laughs> PCA from uh, Professor uh, Verport in Denmark, in Leiden. And they, of course, collect, uh, 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 um, um, this is uh, wheat, uh, cannabis sativa plants. And then they collect it in the morning. They went to a, uh, to a coffee shop collected in the morning, they went to the same coffee shop in the afternoon, and then they, this is an unknown, uh, I don't want to know where is that plant coming from, but they noticed that if they collect these plants from different times from the, the same spot, uh, of course they gave us different uh, metabolic profiles. This is to show you how drug conditions, these guys were, they, they have a problem that these, the physiology of these uh, corals are pretty similar. So they want to know if with metabolic profiling, they can differentiate them. And they said, okay, they collect them and they found, yes, we have different metabolic profilers. These actually look pretty similar, different from this one. So we can probably differentiate these ones from these ones. But then they brought them to the lab and they put them in aquaria and everything changed. All the corals that were put in the, in the reef, they were collected in the reef, they look completely different from the metabolic profiles that, of those who grow in the lab. So you see how important it is, where I, where, where I do my sampling? Do I go and do it in the field sampling or do I have it in a controlled environment in my lab? Okay, sampling techniques. Let's go very fast because I only have 10 minutes. Why, when I think about sampling techniques, I think about two different uh, possibilities. I do I want to do endometabolomics or exometabolomics. This is how a chemical ecologist think. What I want to analyze, so I want to, in the angle, we want to analyze the volatile or the non-volatile, in exo, the same, volatile or non-volatile. And then when we want to do endo in plants, we, for both, for volatile or non-volatile, is endometabolomics. So I have to cut the tissue and do the extraction, isn't it? There's no other way to do endometabolomics. I need to collect the tissue. But when I want to do exometabolomics, it's a little bit different because we can do volatile and non-volatile analysis of, the, of, of a plant. For, for volatile, it's, there's normally used what we call the head space, or actually for plants, it's not so well known as head space. We just collect the volatiles in the atmosphere around our system. 
They could be a static system or a dynamic system. And I will go, uh, there's two options. We can put a SP, SPME uh, uh, code in here that we will absorb all my volatiles that are in, the, in, the, in, in my head space or a PDMS system. And the other way with dynamic is called push pull. That is more or less the same. We can put also the filter, this type of filters here, but we push air, clean air, and also suck air from the system in order to ensure a continuous flow through my package. Okay. This is just some examples. If we have the plan, we can put it in a container, then air is coming to some way into the container without pushing. This is our pool systems. And then we put the volatile trap that it could be SPME. And then we put a pump that is sucking all this atmosphere uh, ox air that is in the surroundings of the plant. But we can also enclosure only one piece of the plant and put it in one specific tissue and then do exactly the same, suck all the air from there and collect in this trap the, the, all of my volatiles. And in a push pull system, it will be pushing here. We put a we clean the air with a sharp filter, push the air that is surrounding here, and then trap all my volatiles here. And you can also even cut the plan and hurt the plan. There's systems that has a gear team that cut it, and then you can collect after hurting your plan. There's actually a new method that I used a long time ago. You can use pieces of silicon, PDNS pieces. You see the PDNS little pieces here. You can place them in little uh, plastic uh, glasses or around your tissues or around your plan if you want to collect them. And then you put this in a thermal absorption unit that actually so far I know Shimatsu has it. You put this in a tube and then you inject directly into uh, this is MS system. But unfortunately, this is not good for quantification because they are, you cannot know exactly how much of what is the limit of absorption of these silicon tubes. Uh, the advantage of this is that you don't manipulate your plant at all. You just put the piece somewhere. I actually tried to improve it a little bit. I put, I put it in a stick and I put the silicon tubes here and I cover the plant with a a cellophane bag that allows the plant to breathe, but not to escape my insects. So the, my insects were enclosed in the plant and they were always going for the plant. And again, so when I want to sample, I can remove the, 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 the plastic bag that is and collect with, a, with tweezers, the silicon tubes, put them in the thermal desorption unit, and then I have a metal for profiling is really good, but not for quantification, okay? But at least if you want to have an idea what metabolites go for, what volatile compounds go for, this is a very, very good technique. It's very fast. And the most important, it's not affecting your, your system at all, okay? Good. Okay. No. You can also do the same in soils. So in the soil, you can also put a, a, a SPME and collect the water in the soil, put a pump in a pool system, or you can also put a push pool system if you want in, in the soils because the roots are part of the plants. And if we, if we think about the non volatiles we have to collect the tissue exudates. So the possibilities is just to collect them directly with a pipette. Yes, but you can. There's also traps for that. There's especially below ground when we can want to collect exudates from roots. You can place place the plant first in a nutrient solution, then it grow. Then you put it transpass it into a sampling solution, and then all your exudates go there. And then you extract with solid phase extraction or with another liquid liquid extraction these these uh, these exudates. You can also use glass beads and uh, vermiculite or vermiculite, or vermiculite to collect the uh, cleaning from the systems. You can then use traps, or you can do it directly in the soil in, in, in a similar manner. Okay? So not only above ground, but also below ground, you can collect exudates. What happened with microbial communities or with, with, with microorganisms? You can also do endometabolomics. If you have volatile or non-volatile, you have to collect the cells because it's endometabolites, isn't it? The ways to collect the cells, you can filter, separate from the media, you have your cells and then you scratch them from the, uh, 
a simpler paper, and then you collect and weigh your samples or freeze dry your samples or uh, quench your samples. But also you can centrifuge uh, your, your, your cells and uh, separate them from the media. Okay. Here we have again, for in the exometabolon, we can also do volat uh, analyze the volatiles from the head space or from the culture or on the non-volatile from the culture media. And then again, here we have uh, head space systems. Now for head space, besides this uh, solid phase microstructure, we can also use this called steel bar so sorting structure, this one. It's just a bar with a, actually an ST me, ST me uh, uh, code inside, and then you just put it to steel in the media. So you can sample the volatiles from the media of your, of your culture. And you can also have it dynamic in the head space and just push pull all your volatiles in there. And this is something that I wanted to discuss. So what do you think in aquatic systems? Because yeah, plants is beautiful because they are here and they are oxygen around us. So all the exometabolon from whatever organism that is above ground is easy. Well, easy. It's easier. But what happened in aquatic systems? What do we collect for the exometabolon? What would you collect for the exometabolon? Let's imagine that we want to analyze this daphnia. And we want to know what metabolites are released in the media. What do you collect? The water. Yeah, there's nothing else that I can collect. The water. This is the media. But do you know the implications that brings to sample water? So if I don't have it under control conditions, and I think our guys know really well how tricky is to deal with, with, with water as an exometabolome uh, contain, a container of our exometabolome. You have to deal with water. And if you have to work, if you work in a city like Cologne that has very hard water, very, very hard water, you have to deal with this hardness of the water. So we have to deal with all these implications. And if you go to the field, how are you 100% sure that your samples are biological replicates. Do you think if I go to a lake and I take a sample and then I take another one, is this second sample a real biological replicate? A lake, I would say, yeah. But what about a river <laughs> with a nice flow? And then people go and sample and then they say that they got a second replicate sample in the same spot, because it was the same spot. <laughs> what, what do you think? You can catch them. Sorry? Cage them. You can? Cage, cage them. Uh, cage them. Within the cage. Yeah, but you, you have to respect the flow. You still have a flow. And define the gradients and you save a cage. That would be a solution, exactly. So that would be a, 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 one of the possibilities that we have, gradients different cages, different possibilities. So you see how difficult it could be just to jump into an aquatic system and not be above ground. And if you go below ground, you have a lot of other issues as well. Okay? Good. And if you want to do endometabolomics on aquatic systems, what do you think? It changed too much? It's more or less the same than the other endometabolomics. So it's not, I think the exometabolome will be the most, the most uh, changeable. Now quenching. So we have different methods of quenching, liquid nitrogen, dry ice, heat, organic solvents, coal, fast filtration. Which one do you like the most? Liquid nitrogen, everyone is in love with liquid nitrogen, but what happens if you're a poor guy from Latin America that don't have liquid nitrogen because it's fucking expensive and it's 45 degrees Celsius outside and liquid nitrogen wouldn't operate in one second. What do you do? Dry ice, exactly. So you change to the next session. And then, uh, some people heat the samples. When do you don't heat the samples? If you are not sure that the heat will damage your samples, don't hit, don't use any heat at all. So if you're doing full non-targeted, don't hit, don't inactivate. But if you know that you want to inactivate a special type of enzymes of your sample that are degrading your compounds, so of course you can hit until you can uh, inactivate your enzymes. But this is very special cases. Okay. Organic solvents, call organic solvents, yes, they are useful. 
And actually, I would say that the, what we all do mostly is liquid nitrogen and a combination with organic solvents, with coal organic solvents, isn't it? We are more or less all at the same page, I would say, more than no. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's what I want to listen. So you can have that problem that you quench and frozen all the metabolism, and then when you put them in a cold four degrees, maybe minus 20 degrees, that you put the methanol in minus 20, and then some of the enzymes can go back and start. Uh, uh, being active again. So you can change uh, dramatically if you don't do, use them at the same time, but you have to be careful with them. And the last one, fast, fast filtration. So you can just uh, remove uh, all the media as fast as possible in order to reduce the, the aqua system from your microorganisms and reduce the amount of water. What about freeze drying? Is freeze drying a quenching uh, uh, method? What do you think? It's okay that we should longer if you have it with uh, minus eight or minus twenty. I, I have heard people that call freeze drying as a quenching method. Don't say, but, uh, yeah, we done fresh fish. Okay, good. Well, any other thoughts about freeze drying? Because this is the uh, I will jump this because this is just examples. You will have the slides, so you just check this example. This is examples about quenching methods and different comparisons. I just want to show you how different, uh, when you use different methods for quenching, how are the different results? But I don't have, oh, I don't have so much time. Yeah? I just want to add one. Um, uh, essence. Uh, for example, if you work with plant lipids, uh, you have lipases which uh, are usually killed by adding phosphoric acid also to the uh, or formic acid. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So when you have worked with lipids, definitely acidification could help to to inhibit your degradation. Drying, freeze drying. How do you dry? And some people said, ah, freeze drying doesn't affect my sample. Actually, it does. When you have, if you compare here Arabidopsis and Pierce, of course they are different. But here we have Arabidopsis freeze dry and non freeze dry. Look how different is the metabolic profiles. And here you have freeze dry peer samples and freeze dry uh, non freeze dry peer samples. So freeze dry change your metabolic profiles, but then it's a compromise. Yes. Any method will change the metabolic Yeah, definitely. Minus. Definitely, we we have to deal with that. Everything what you do with your sample, as I told you before, if you put them into an elevator and run them into the lab, that will affect your sample. The most important is you do exactly the same with all of them. Yeah. Okay. Good. And try to minimize all those those variables. Good extraction of metabolites. Let's go with extraction of metabolites. And here, before extracting the metabolites, we have to do something: is to break the cells if the cells are too too harsh, isn't it? If I'm not doing with exometabolites. So to to lyse to do the lysis of the tissues, we we have different options: saline solutions, fast uh, free stoy, ultrasound, bead shaker, microwave. I want to hear what do you use here? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. How do you use ultrasound with a needle inside, or 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 you put it in a bat? No, in a bat. Okay. You you're not scared that the you didn't never have an issue with the, the your tubes are breaking or heating up too much. Yep. So you put ice in the ice bath. No. Yeah. We 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 put we put ice in the ice bath, for example, to to reduce the heating in the sample. How long do you put the in the in the in the ultrasound? Thirty minutes. You know. Thirty minutes, and you don't get heating. No. How is that possible? Okay, good. That's how. Also, can you send me please the brand of this? <laughs> because I think you are also. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Any other thoughts? What kind of uh, cell lice? How you break your cells? Your tissues? Shaker. On. Ah, with bits. Okay. Yeah, that I like that a lot, especially for endometabolomics. Is. You know, for heart tissues, plant tissues, it's really good, really, really, really good. Some, some other. Yeah, you do. You use it. Yeah. How it works for you? So I put the samples. No, I know how it works, but how how it works? So how it is working good for you? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. good for a uh, very resistant cells. Okay, for very resistant cells. 
Cool. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yes. So we have it's it's your decision, of course, to test which you, I with every time that I do an unknown targeted and somebody comes with this real samples, can we do metabolomics with that? This is one of the paths that we have to define how to license and how to break these cells the best. Sometimes with ultrasound is enough, but sometimes in the lab, you only have this ultrasound that is a needle and is the same needle for all the samples. So you're risking a lot of cross-contamination. I personally don't like the needle inside the samples. I prefer the beads and just shaking with the beads. And then I actually combine, for example, beads plus ultrasound. So my protocols have a little bit of, but not 30 minutes. Uh, a little bit shorter. That's the high end. Yeah, that's, that's too high for me. And then when we go to do the extraction of metabolites, my thought is I want to know where I want to put the samples. That's what I think is the best thing. I want to do liquid chromatography or gas chromatography. If I want to do liquid chromatography, do I want to do liquid extraction, liquid liquid extraction, solid phase extraction, microdialysis, or solid phase liquid extraction? These are the options that I think for liquid chromatography would be available. Somebody else think about some other instruction for liquid chromatography? No. For gas chromatography, we all can also ask to use liquid liquid because we can use a very non-polar phase and get this non-polar phase or very organic phase into the GC or for the GC. We can also do solid phase extraction. We can choose a solid phase saturation special for very non-polar compounds. And we can also, of course, elute the solid for the solid phase and extraction strategies that we use for the headspace. We elute our metabolites from there. And it's pretty straightforward using a very non-polar solvent like uh, hexane or isohexane. Okay. Any thoughts here? Because I'm taking a lot of time. Away. Good. We can choose solvents. I will not go there so much. Not here, not here. Also not here. Uh, this is something important that most of the samples, sometimes people work with samples that are very not so dirty. But if you work with very dirty samples with full of proteins, full of lipids, and you don't want to deal neither with proteins, neither with lipids, you have to remove them. And one, there's several ways. You can centrifuge, you can use solid phase extraction to clean your extra, remove most of the polar stuff and keep the medium polarity, non-polarity, depending what do you want. You can use uh, uh, ion exchange cartridges to go only for those compounds that are anionic or cationic, depending what do you want to, to, to select. You can also do fractionation to select your compounds. Oh, I don't want my non-polar uh, uh, part of the chromatogram. I only want to work with my uh, in, in polar part. So you can also do fractionation in order to clean and pre-clean, I would say, and concentrate your sample. And so on. Those are different options that you have. And of course, for EC, you can derivatize. And this is just a list that I will not read, but uh, you will have it there. Uh, different possibilities to derivatize your molecules, to make them more stable, to make some of them more volatile or volatile in order to be injectable into the GC, okay? <laughs> I apologize again for the all the problems here with the computer and uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention. And I hope after the coffee we go to let's acquire some data with Allegra. And uh, right now, I would invite you to drink a coffee. We have 20, only 20 minutes, please, because Allegra, it's on, it will be on time meeting with us at half uh, uh, past three o'clock. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for the technical.